Uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, get started? Uh, and uh, I want to welcome everyone to the <coughs> uh, monthly Knesset Planet Institute lecture series. And uh, today we have a, a very interesting program on uh, ethical vignettes and living donor kidney transplantation. And uh, we have a, a good set of speakers today. We have Dr. Venkat, who's going to be presenting the main vignettes, and Dr. Eshelman. Uh, our Director of Transplant Psychology is going to be discussing uh, the uh, workup and evaluation and frame the psychosocial issues among living donors. Uh, I will not uh, spend too much time introducing the speakers. They both are uh, senior, I will not say how senior, uh, Thank you. transplant professionals at Ford. I think uh, Dr. Venkat uh, has been here over 30 years, I think. Uh, maybe something like that, 28 years? No. Yeah. And Five years. Now, one, one <laughs> uh, I can say for sure, though, that I did my first transplant research project as a surgical resident with you uh, a little over 20 years ago, and this was on the thyroid withdrawal among living kidney donation, and that was your brainchild uh, in the United States on thyroid withdrawal among living kidney transplantation. And, uh, and you've been a pioneer in many areas of kidney transplant and trained many of the staff who actually some of them are here. Some have went on to lead other programs in kidney transplant. And Dr. Venkat was past medical director of the kidney transplant program at Henry Ford and has seen it grow to its current uh, profile. And uh, Dr. Eshelman is uh, our transplant uh, psychologist. Uh, she started the program at Henry Ford and expanded with a, uh, a fellowship and a postdoc program, and, and as he's been a pioneer in transplant psychology in the country, and has an extensive uh, research uh, interest in quality of life, uh, among others, and I will not uh, detail these too much, but I think we'll have a terrific discussion, and uh, I'll introduce Dr. Venkat. Thank you. Thank you, Marwan, for the invitation to speak today and for that very generous introduction. Only my mother would have believed everything you said about me. Okay? Uh, I want to begin my talk by paraphrasing Yogi Berra. As I stand before you to give this talk today, I recall a famous statement that Yogi Berra made, uh, I feel like deja vu all over again. Some years ago, I did a medical grand rounds presentation, and presiding over it was Dr. Popovich then chairman of medicine, and I recalled at that time that he was a fourth-year medical student and an intern under my supervision. By the time I gave the medical grand rounds, of course, he had risen to the rank of chairman, and he, of course, he has moved on to bigger things now. And as Marwan already mentioned, I think it was in the late 1980s when I supervised and mentored Marwan for his first national presentation on a transplant-related topic. I was computer naive then, I'm still computer naive. He showed me how to prepare a PowerPoint presentation um, using an old Macintosh computer, if I remember correctly. And I think I helped him with the scientific aspects of the presentation. He did very well, by the way. The abstract was very well received. And Marwan, of course, is presiding over today's function in his capacity as the director of the Transplant Institute and recently appointed chief medical officer Congratulations. I don't know if congratulations is the correct word uh, for Henry Ford Hospital. What this proves is that if you are associated with me during your training, at least some of you will reach very important positions in life. Okay. I must add that uh, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest with regards to today's talk. I must say my heart is pure, or perhaps I should say my kidneys are in the right place. This is the outline of my presentation today. I'll present five illustrative case vignettes, each of which posed very difficult ethical problems. And I will outline for you briefly the ethical decision making that went into accepting or rejecting the particular donor for living donor transplantation, and also outline for you the outcomes in these cases after the transplant was done in some of them and so on. In the second part of my talk, I'll give you some general guidelines for approaching ethical issues in live donor transplantation. Some of these guidelines are based on my own personal experience, and some are based on recent recommendations in the literature. 
I will finish my talk with a very brief recommendation about some revisions that we have to consider in our donor and recipient consent forms. These issues are not clearly addressed in our present donor and recipient consent forms, and I will address those issues towards the end of my talk. A few initial disclaimers. All case vignettes are personal occasions seen by me, but some are from the 1980s and 1990s. And I must add immediately that the approach to the ethical problems posed by these cases may be very different today, especially given the stringent rules of HIPAA and the formal role that the donor advocate and the transplant psychologist Akhre Shaman plays and the social worker and the pre-transplant coordinators play in the selection process now. I must say that in the 80s and early 90s, these processes were not formally in place, and many a time one physician or two physicians made the decision without the total input from the team. In cases of older vintage, my own approach to ethical issues will be presented. My transplant colleagues today may or may not agree with me 100% on the decisions that we made. I must point out there were no other living donor options in any of these five cases, so we could not have solved the ethical problem by moving on to a, another living donor who was available. No such living donor was available in any of the five cases that I'm going to present. The first case, I've titled it Case of the Mistress Donor. A 48-year-old Caucasian male with end-stage renal disease due to diabetic nephropathy was accepted for kidney transplantation in our program. He was married. He had two minor biological children because they were minors. They were not, obviously, donors. His 38-year-old female friend of 10 years duration was found to be a medically suitable, willing, altruistic, voluntary donor who appeared very interested in the welfare of the potential recipient. But the surprise came during our donor evaluation. She voluntarily disclosed that she was having an extramarital affair with the potential recipient. In addition, the recipient requested that the transplant team should not reveal the donor's identity to his spouse. He wanted to protect his marriage and asked us not to reveal the donor's identity to his wife. The two ethical issues that we faced in this particular case, should the mistress in an extramarital, immoral relationship to a married man be accepted as his donor, and how to handle the request that his wife should not be informed about the identity of the donor. Our ethical decision making went as follows. When we discussed it in our weekly meeting, the majority opinion was that the transplant team should not function as a moral police. A medically suitable, truly altruistic donor giving fully informed consent should be accepted for kidney donation. As far as the recipient's request that his wife be not told, we told him that if his wife asked us specifically, any member of the medical team, she will be told that donor information is confidential and cannot be divulged. But I pointed out to him that a large number of people came into contact with the donor during the hospitalization, and there is no way that we can guarantee that his wife will not learn the true identity of the donor from one of these people because we cannot tell everyone who might come into contact with the donor not to tell the wife if she asks and so on. And we also, I also pointed out to him that the transplant team cannot be held responsible in any way for any effects such a discovery of the donor's identity might have on his marriage. A minority of members of the transplant team felt that a transplant involving an immoral pair should not be done. The majority opinion prevailed, and the transplant was done. There was immediate graft function. The creatinine came down very nicely. But three days after transplant, the kidney stopped making urine, and a non-invasive study showed no blood flow to the kidney. There was arterial thrombosis, and this led to allograft nephrectomy three days after transplantation. The next week, some members of the transplant team who were opposed to this transplant in the first place told me that this was God's way of punishing the couple for their immorality. To our knowledge, the wife never asked any member of the medical team about the donor's identity. For all that we know, she might have known about her husband's extramarital affair and might have accepted it and acquiesced in it. He later received a deceased donor kidney transplant. About a year later, he was listed for a deceased donor kidney transplant, and he received a deceased donor kidney transplant. 
God did not punish him immediately this time. This transplant functioned for four years until he dropped dead one day at home uh, of, of an apparent myocardial infarction, which is not an unexpected happening in a diabetic recipient, as most of you know. As far as I know, his marriage was intact during the four years of follow-up after the disease donor transplantation. Every time he came to the clinic, his wife usually accompanied him, and their relationship appeared very cordial for all practical purposes when they came to the clinic and so on. The donor came back for her immediate post-operative follow-up visits, but we have not had any contact with the donor after that. Today, we are required to follow all donors for a minimum period of two years after transplantation, but these rules were not in place back then. Uh, I don't know what happened to the donor afterwards. I don't know whether the extramarital affair continued in spite of the first transplant being lost within three days, his first transplant being lost within three days after she donated a kidney. The second case vignette that I want to present is the case of the sexual molester sibling donors. A 28-year-old Caucasian female with stage 5 chronic kidney disease, secondary to chronic glomerulonephritis, was accepted for preemptive living-related donor kidney transplant from a perfectly matched, two haplotype matched 40-year-old brother. Brother was found to be medically acceptable, willing, altruistic, very voluntary donor, and he appeared very keen on helping his sister. So based on my medical evaluation of the donor, I thought this was an ideal situation, two haplotype match, we should proceed with the transplant. However, the surprise came about a week before transplantation. The potential recipient called the social worker and said, the potential donor had sexually molested me when I was a child, and she was afraid that he may expect sexual favors as a reward for donation. This taught me a very important lesson. Patients tend to tell physicians what they consider are medical problems. They divulge social, relationship, psychological problems more readily to other members of the transplant team, such as the social worker, the psychologist, or the pre-transplant coordinators, and so on. The physicians may not learn about this by themselves. The ethical issues posed in this case were, should the potential recipient be advised to decline kidney donation by her brother to avoid future sexual demands by him? This is a second point. I did not think about this when I circulated this case to Dr. Denny. He brought up this point. He should have perhaps explored her possible reaction to a part of her molester's body being permanently present in her body after kidney donation. We did not address this issue as part of our ethical evaluation. What I did was I brought her in for a meeting with the social worker and the pre-transplant coordinators. I don't know if Dr. Eshelman was present at that time. It was pointed out to her that donation may be his way of making amends for his past sins against her. We strongly pointed out that she did not owe him anything in kind in return for kidney donation. She can be grateful to him, but she did not owe him anything else in return for kidney donation. She can accept the kidney if she was confident that she can resist any future sexual advances. She's an adult now, and if she was confident that she can turn him down, she can accept the kidney. And I also pointed out that as a two haplotype match, biologically, he was an excellent donor. She thought about this for a week and finally decided to go ahead with the kidney transplantation. We followed her for 12 years post-transplant with excellent renal function and no major medical problems. She was employed during this period. And after 12 years, she moved out of state, if I remember correctly, to Georgia. And I have not had any further contact with her or any further medical information about her. I used to ask her every time she came to the clinic for a follow-up visit whether she has had any problems with her donor after the kidney donation. And she assured me that the donor moved to California shortly after donating a kidney in Michigan. And she has never heard from him afterwards. So she apparently did not have any further problems with this donor. The third case I'm going to present is the case of the reluctant offspring donor pressurized by the stepmother. A 68-year-old Caucasian male with end-stage renal disease of unknown etiology was accepted for transplantation. His first wife had died, and he had remarried. His son, through his first marriage, came in as a potential kidney donor. Initial lab tests and 
imaging studies all showed that there was no contraindication medically to kidney donation by this particular donor. And when I evaluated this donor, this was after all the tests had been done, he told me that he strongly disliked his stepmother. Apparently, she was coercing him by telling him repeatedly that if you do not donate, your father might die and you will have to live with this guilt for the rest of your life. The ethical issues posed by this particular case are as follows. Should this medically suitable donor be excluded because of the pressure by his stepmother, because it is a generally accepted principle that donation should be free of any form of coercion, either uh, financial coercion or employment-related coercion or emotional coercion and so on. And the other issue that I thought about was, should I tell the donor about the recipient's risk factors that might affect his post-transplant longevity? And this might soften his feeling of guilt if he doesn't, decides not to donate. If I tell him that your father is 68 years old and he has this medical problem and he may not live very long whether you gave him a kidney or not, that might assuage his feeling of guilt. And the other question that I was faced with was, if he wanted, should we invent a medical excuse for him not to donate so that he can save face with his father and his stepmother? I informed the potential donor that the decision to donate or not was entirely his, and he should not donate out of a feeling of guilt. I told him, this was back in the early 90s, if I remember correctly, as a 68-year-old potential recipient and a heavy smoker, he had smoked, stopped smoking only three months earlier, his father might have problems affecting longevity after transplantation. I told him that father can be on dialysis until receiving a deceased donor transplant. I also told him that live donor transplantation is not a life-saving procedure. Live donor kidney transplantation is not a life-saving procedure, but a quality of life enhancing procedure because the transplant can be done earlier, better graft and patient survival, and less chance of rejection and less intense immunosuppression, which may be particularly important in an older recipient. And I told him, again, this was early 90s, if he wished, we can invent an actual medical excuse for him. He thought about it for a while, discussed it in detail with his wife, and he came back to me and refused a medical excuse. The statement he made is that nothing changes the fact that he is my father and I'm his son. I will donate my kidney to him and then get out of his life, and maybe he also meant get out of the life of the stepmother forever. We did the transplant after he consented. The transplant functioned well for three years when a lung mass was discovered in the recipient, and he died seven months later of disseminated lung cancer. I remind you again, this person was a heavy cigarette smoker and had stopped only three months before transplantation. The donor came back for his initial post-operative post evaluations, but I've not had any contact with the donor since then. I don't think we have seen him at this institution since then. I'll give you a little more information on the current thinking in ethical circles on inventing a medical excuse and sharing with the recipient, uh, sharing with the donor the recipient's risk factors which might affect post-transplant longevity. The fourth case that I want to present is that of the older recipient and young spousal donor, a 68-year-old male with end-stage renal disease secondary to diabetic nephropathy was accepted for kidney transplantation. Later, he came in with his 22-year-old, he was 68, his wife was 22-year-old wife, for her donor evaluation and insisted on being present in the examining room during her donor evaluation, ostensibly to translate because she spoke very little English. The ethical issues that were posed in this case, should he be allowed to be present during the donor evaluation? And the second question was, should such a young donor be accepted for an older diabetic whose longevity post-transplant may be limited. This was our ethical decision making and outcome in this case. I told him that our policy was to evaluate the donor without the recipient present. I can't overemphasize this point. You can see the obvious conflict of interest in this situation. Never evaluate a donor in the presence of a recipient, of the potential recipient. We provided her a translator through the Henry Ford Hospital Service, and the donor informed us that she was in a very unhappy marriage, 
and was being coerced by her husband to donate. I couldn't find any medical contraindication to donation. However, she requested that a specific medical excuse be given to her spouse. She said that you won't be satisfied unless you give him a specific medical excuse. Again, this was an early case, and I used two already documented lab results to declare her medically unfit. 24-hour creatinine clearance was slightly low at 75 ml per minute, but her serum creatinine was only 0.5 milligrams per deciliter. I was pretty certain that this was an under-collection of a 24-hour urine, and if we read this, she would have probably come out okay. And I also found some RBCs on urine microscopy, and she told me that she was having her period during this time when we collected the urine. Obviously, the RBCs could have been due to menstruation, but I used these two facts to tell him that tell him and tell her in his presence that uh, she was not a medically suitable donor. While turning her down as a donor, I told her and her husband that they are free to seek a second opinion from a different transplant center, and I offered them assistance by giving them all the laboratory tests that we have done uh, to them so that they can take it to the uh, other institution that they were going to, but we have not heard anything further from either the husband or the potential donor. The fifth vignette I want to present is the offspring donor with misattributed paternity. This is a current case. The transplant has not been done yet. A 27-year-old Caucasian male was evaluated as donor to his 61-year-old father who had diabetic nephropathy, and we were considering a preemptive kidney transplantation. The potential donor had attention deficit disorder and was on medication for this. He also carried a diagnosis of chronic anxiety, some panic attacks, and mild depression, but no suicidal attempts. His mother had a history of bipolar disorder, and on the day of his wedding shower, after talking to him about something, the mother attempted suicide by shooting herself in the chest. It was an unsuccessful suicidal attempt. And his two siblings, biological siblings, he believed, blamed him repeatedly for his mother's suicide attempt uh, because it occurred shortly after they had talked to each other on the day of his wedding shower. The wedding was eventually canceled. He did not marry that particular girl. Dr. Eshelman and the donor advocate felt that the mental illness was not severe, can give informed consent. The patient was capable of giving informed consent. There was no contraindication from a psychological perspective for kidney donation by this particular donor. Shortly before I saw him for donor evaluation, the HLA lab gave us a heads up by saying that based on the HLA testing, this son could not be the biological son of the father, though he believed and though we were told that this was a biological father's son pair, they said the HLA matching did not show the required one haplotype match, and therefore this could not be a biological son. This was after the fact. They were already, uh, the father had been accepted. The son was under the impression that he was a biological son. We had not uh, addressed this issue in the consent form. And all that I did during the evaluation was repeatedly questioned him as to what his motive was in donating this kidney. He said, I don't need any motive. He's my biological father. He means a lot to me. I want to help my father in any way possible. Uh, and he kept saying that this is my biological father. So it was very clear that he believed strongly that this is his biological father. The two ethical issues posed by this pair was one, the psychiatric history of ADD, anxiety, and depression but both the psychologist and the donor advocate felt that the psychological issues were not severe enough and he was capable of giving informed consent. So that was not a major issue. The major issue was the misattributed paternity. Both the father, um, at least the son believed that it was the biological father. And the question was, should the father, the potential recipient, be informed about the fact that this was not a biological son? And should the son, the potential donor, be informed that he was not the biological offspring of this particular recipient. The problem I faced was that the Henry Ford Hospital recipient and donor consent forms do not specifically address the issue of disclosure of misattributed paternity. I went into the literature and I found fairly extensive literature on this in the genetic testing literature where this problem is frequently dealt with. 
I didn't find very many papers. There's, I found one paper about this issue in the transplant literature. The ethicists have argued that points favoring disclosure are as, are as follows. The donor should be willing to donate even knowing that he is not a biological offspring. Otherwise, he or she is uh, donating under false pretense. The recipient, after going through the internet or re after doing some reading, might be hoping for a better outcome if the donor was a biological offspring because it's a one haplotype match, he or she might think that there might be a lesser chance of rejection with a one haplotype match donor. Otherwise, he's accepting the kidney under false pretense. And the other issue, of course, is loss of credibility and legal liability for the transplant center if the information comes out later. The points against disclosure, this may cause family discord, especially put the mother in trouble if the father did not know the truth that this was not his biological son. If the father knew the truth and the mother knew the truth, then it might not have put the mother in trouble. But if the father did not know and we disclosed this information, the wife might be in a very bad situation. But the literature also says that in this particular situation where we are dealing with only the father and the child, the mother is not our patient and we do not have any obligation to protect the mother and because she's not our patient and it should not be a major consideration in this situation. As I said, this was after the fact and we had not addressed this issue in the consent form. So I decided to treat him as a willing, voluntary, living, unrelated donor and we did not disclose anything about the misattributed paternity uh, in this particular case to either the son or to the father. And the transplant is pending. As I said, the transplant has not been done yet because we are in the process of determining that the son, the potential donor, will have enough support, family support, during uh, his convalescence after kidney donation. I want to very briefly mention two other very common ethical problems that we encounter in selecting a living donor. One I've already mentioned briefly, a very young donor, say a grandchild, wanting to donate a kidney to a very old recipient with multiple comorbidities and limited life expectancy after transplantation. The other problem that we commonly face is a donor, often moderately obese, plus minus obese, metabolic syndrome, with a very strong family history of hypertension, diabetes, or chronic kidney disease, especially a minority donor. I think the key unanswered question in the literature is, does uninephrectomy per se increase the risk of chronic kidney disease in the remaining kidney? I think this question is unanswered. If we know a definite answer to this, we can make a decision. In some parts of the world, even diabetics without kidney disease are accepted as donors, for example, in Japan, where there is no uh, extensive disease donor transplant program. Uh, even borderline diabetics and frank diabetics without kidney involvement are accepted as kidney donors. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to quickly go through some guidelines for approaching ethical issues in live donor transplantation. As I said, some of this is my own personal approach and some of this is literature based. It should be evident to you by now that ethical issues are not uncommon in live donor transplantation. In fact, some authors have argued that any living related donor is under coercion because of family and maybe recipient medical team's expectations that a living related donor will step forward and donate a kidney. So some authors have argued there is no truly coercion free living related donor transplantation. Fortunately, most potential donors have made a firm decision to donate after thinking about various aspects of donation, discussed it with their significant other and family members and so on before coming in for evaluation. It is rare for potential donors, in my experience, to want to change their decision to donate after evaluation, but it can certainly happen as it happened in the case number four that I presented. The potential donor, as I have emphasized before, should always be examined alone, never in the presence of the potential recipient. And you should never put the potential donor on the spot by telling him or her that he or she can be a good donor in the potential recipient's presence. Never put the donor on the spot. Donor should know he or she can withdraw from donating at any time up to the surgery. 
If the donor is turned down, one should explain the right to seek second opinion in another transplant center, and assistance should be offered by giving them test results that you have already completed. You don't want to give them your opinion or the reasons why you turned them on as a donor. An important ethical question is, is donor entitled to know recipient's risk factors and post-transplant prognosis? People have argued in favor by saying that living donors putting oneself at risk to help the recipient and should know recipient prognosis and longevity before donation. This has been the past opinion about this subject. But current literature indicates that most of this opinion is against disclosing recipient risk factors to the donor for the following, to the recipient for the following reasons. People have argued that if a recipient has been found acceptable for transplantation, he or she should be equally acceptable for live or deceased donor transplant. You cannot have different sets of standards for living donor transplantation and deceased donor transplantation. Obviously, there is recipient's right to privacy, particularly in the HIPAA era. One is concerned about the recipient's rights to privacy, and you cannot disclose information to the potential donor. A case in point is the HIV-positive recipient. As you know, the privacy rights are very stringent in HIV-positive patients, and HIV-positive patients are being considered for kidney transplantation, though we have not done one in this hospital yet. However, if the donor comes to know that the potential recipient is HIV positive, he or she may decide against donating a kidney because of the belief that the outcomes are not going to be good in a HIV positive recipient. Some centers have taken the approach that the recipient should be asked to inform the donor that he or she is HIV positive. The counter argument that some people have advanced in the literature is that the transplant results in a carefully selected HIV positive patient are better than that in an elderly diabetic who has extensive vascular disease. So actually you have better outcomes in the HIV positive patient who is carefully selected. So if you're willing to accept a living donor for a diabetic, why make a special case about a HIV positive donor? What about the issue of inventing and documenting medical excuse? It was an accepted practice in the past but now has become much more controversial. Current views are largely against inventing medical excuse. The views that are expressed in the literature are physicians should never lie even to help a coerced or unwilling donor, should just tell the recipient that the donor was found unsuitable without giving any specific reasons why the donor was found unsuitable. And the literature also adds that donor perception of coercion or concerns about serious operative morbidity or mortality vis-a-vis -vis the donor's obligations to spouse and children as wage earner, or the possible need that he or she may have to donate a kidney to some other family member in the future are justifiable reasons for excluding a donor. If this sort of coercion is felt by the donor, this is a justifiable medical reason for excluding the donor. If you invent a medical excuse, certain problems might arise. Donor may have difficulty maintaining falsehood long term. If the truth ever comes out, credibility problems for the donor with the family, of course, and loss of credibility and medical legal liability for the transplant team will arise. And if you falsely document a medical excuse in the donor's medical record, this is legally and ethically wrong. This could, be, this could result in possible future employment insurance problems for the donor and medical legal liability for the transplant team. Also, donor given a medical excuse now may have to donate to spouse, offspring, or another recipient in the future, and how are you going to explain the fact that you medically excused this person previously, and now you're allowing this person to donate a kidney? These are some of the problems that people have uh, expressed in the literature. I believe strongly that the transplant team should not be paternalistic. One author says, whose kidney is, is it to donate anyway? It is not your kidney. It is the donor's kidney. Our task is to ensure the donor is medically suitable, no short-term and long-term risks of donation to oneself, is able to comprehend and give informed consent, is under no coercion, and donation is entirely altruistic. It's a gift that cannot be repaid, 
and financial or other tangible rewards are illegal in our practice here. Donors desire to improve the recipient's quality of life even for a short time, irrespective of the medical team's assessment of recipient's longevity should generally prevail in making a decision about whether accepting the donor or not. Donors should be informed that there is no mechanism currently to compensate the donor for costs of travel, stay, lost wages, etc. I think we oversell the benign nature of laparoscopic nephrectomy to many of our donors. We should be honest enough to tell them that the pain, anxiety, stress, and the duration of rehabilitation may be worse than in individual may be worse in individual patients than in the general population of laparoscopic nephrectomy patients. The possibility of feeling guilty and depressed if recipient outcome is bad should be addressed. And one should be honest enough to tell the donor that perception of safety, long-term safety of kidney donation is based largely on studies of Caucasian donors and not necessarily applicable to other minority races, donors from other minority races. Donors should also be informed about the following facts. Workup may uncover diagnosis that may be reportable to outside agencies. If you discover a communicable disease, you may be legally bound to report to outside governmental agencies. And such diagnosis might, might exclude the donor and might require treatment at donor's cost or through donor's insurance. I don't think we always do a good job of disclosing this information. After donation, some donors may have long-term employment and life health or disability insurance problems. Majority don't, but some patients, some donors do. And it's been recently said that one should also give the donor the information about national versus our particular centers, one-year patient and graft survival, and what kind of donor outcome problems that we might have experienced in our own experience at our institution. The last part of my talk is about the need to revise our live donor and recipient consent forms. I must thank Linda Munro for bringing to my attention uh, a revised, more extensive, stringent donor guidelines issued by February 2013 by UNOS and OPTN. I've given you the website if you want to see the details. And this document requires signed documentation by the donor in the consent form, acknowledging many of the points I've already made in my presentation under guidelines. Two important statements caught my attention in this document. One statement was that the recovery hospital, that is the hospital removing the kidney, will take all reasonable precautions to provide confidentiality for the donor and recipient. And the second statement was any transplant candidate may have risk factors for increased morbidity or mortality that are not disclosed to potential recipients. These statements are made very emphatically in this new revised recommendation. On the basis of this new revised recommendations, I think we should consider revising our donor and recipient consent forms. With regards to the recipient consent, I think we'll have to add a statement. The donor may be excluded by the transplant team for various reasons. In the interest of donor confidentiality, the specific reasons will not be disclosed to the recipient. In the donor consent form, any transplant candidate, that is the recipient, may have risk factors for increased morbidity or mortality. In the interest of recipient confidentiality, such risk factors will not be disclosed to the donor. And in both consent forms, this is in the light of the recent case of misattributed paternity that, we, that I was encountering for the first time, tissue HLA typing for transplantation may reveal evidence contradicting the biological parent-offspring relationship between the donor and recipient. This information will be disclosed only if both parties agree in writing in advance of testing to such disclosure. Obviously, if the donor agrees and the recipient does not agree or vice versa, you cannot disclose this information. You don't want one member of the pair knowing the truth and not the other member of the pair. You can see the obvious problems it will pose. And the other thought that I had was that we do a lot of testing before the formal consent form is signed, and we perhaps should have them sign a new revised detailed consent form before we start the testing so that unnecessary testing can be avoided if uh, the donor or recipient is not willing to sign the new revised extensive consent form. 
In this last slide, I've shown some of the references I found particularly useful. I'll leave this slide on the screen. I'll stop at this point and request Dr. Eshelman to make her comment from her perspective as of our, as our transplant psychologist. I must say she's a very important resource person to us when psychological and ethical problems arise in the arena of living donor transplantation. Dr. Eshelman. Um, I wanted to just share a couple of slides with you because we do have um, UNOS's new uh, psychosocial evaluation checklist for living donors and some of the issues that we've talked about are on this. Um, these are things that we have to be able to check off that all of these things have, have been discussed. And these are part of our routine evaluation. When somebody comes forward to donate a kidney or part of a liver, um, it's, I, the way I see it and what I tell people is it, they're, they're agreeing to think about it and consider it and to get more information. So they, we don't want them to consign a, a, sign a consent that they're definitely going to do it because they're checking it out. And they have the option to stop the evaluation at any point, and um, sometimes they do. So I think that really takes the pressure off that they're, they're checking it out, and we don't want the um, recipient or the recipient's family to too soon think that they've already given consent. I think it, one of the questions we also asked came up in Dr. Venkat's case of the mistress donor, and this is one that I remember very well. One of the questions we ask is, what expectations are there associated with this? So um, with that particular um, situation, I asked the donor, who was the mistress, um, what are you hoping will happen if you donate? And she, although she said she wasn't hoping that he would leave his wife, I, I asked specifically, are you hoping he'll leave his wife? Are you hoping that you know you will marry him or whatever? She said no, no, but I think she probably did have that fantasy and that hope. Um, but I think it's important to ask, what are your expectations? And so that even if they deny that they have important expectations, it helps them to think about it and to see how realistic those expectations are. With um, the, some of these other situations, the um, sibling molester, I think it's important that this kind of issue comes up. It probably would have been better earlier before, one week before the scheduled surgery. And although we don't ask anything about that specifically, we do ask routinely, is there any history of abuse or trauma or tragedy in your life? And that often does bring up the issue of, yes, somebody abused and, and who is it and, and how might that impact this whole situation. As far as reluctant um, donors, yes, um, often it isn't our patient's idea to come forward and often the family does pressure people. And we can come up with lots of examples of that. Sometimes it's sort of the black sheep of the family who, um, was you know a bad kid or something and this is a way to become more enfranchised in the family by donating and then being a good member of the family um, and sometimes it's well you don't have any children and you're not that busy or you're unemployed at the moment so you should be the donor but it truly has to be the donor's choice you know do they understand and is this really what they want to do and I highly um, support your idea that we need to evaluate the donor and the recipient totally separately. We do use um, Pacific interpreters and not family interpreters partly for that reason because family interpreters sometimes filter what the information is so that our um, non-English speaking person may not really get the whole story. We're very fortunate to have people in the Transplant Institute who speak other languages fluently, and that makes it easier for, for some of our donors as well as recipients. Um, as far as a medical excuse turn down, I think that um, I, I like your idea of uh, making that in the consent that don't expect to know why you're being turned down. Don't, don't expect the recipient to know why the donor is being turned down. I think if they understand that up front, um, they, they 
it will make it easier on um, the donor. Even if the donor really, really wants to donate and something comes up, um, it still is the donor's choice not to disclose that to the recipient, um, whatever it is. Um, and I think that, that that should be in the consent. Um, also, you mentioned in terms of informed consent, letting um, donors understand that the pain may be more than they like to think about it. And when I see donors, I see them um, up front when they're going through the evaluation. I see them in the hospital after donation right before discharge. I see them at the two-week follow-up. And most of them up front are young, healthy people. They have not had pain experiences much of anything. Some have had childbirth, but most have not had um, a lot of pain. And often, and I kind of joke around with them, many people feel like this is sort of like drive-through. Drive-through, drop off the kidney, you're on your way. Um, and they don't really think about the pain. And that's kind of something that we don't like to think about the pain, but I think it's important that they recognize it. And when I see these folks in the hospital, pain is, is more than they expect. And when I ask them, is there anything we can do to prepare people better? Did you feel like you were informed? Um, that kind of thing in the hospital. Um, the, the main negative thing that they say is, uh, it's more pain than I thought. And it's not really the incision, it's more the, the gas. And they're kind of surprised with that, even though they've been told. They routinely are, give very glowing responses about the nursing on H6, and they love the doctors, and very few of them have complaints. But when I pull for it, looking for what can we do better, they do say that the pain is worse than they expected. Um, Let's see. The other issue with pain with um, donors is that um, they don't expect that they might feel nauseated, they might be constipated and all of this, and their idea of pain is not close to what they're actually experiencing. And I don't know how we can present that any better because when I see them pre, they often say, oh, yeah, everybody says the pain's bad, but I'm tough, I can handle it. And they really don't want to understand about the pain. This is um, part of what we do. We look at psychiatric history, cognitive functioning. Some of our donors have cognitive deficits. And we have to look at, you know, can they give informed consent? Do they really understand? Some may be illiterate. Some may be uneducated. And we want to make sure that they are, um, have, have the capacity for informed consent. We also look at substance abuse and dependency in the donor in, in the same way that we do with recipients. And whether it's a donor or recipient, a time before a transplant is a, uniquely, a unique opportunity in that they want something from us and we have a chance to tell them in order to be as strong and healthy as you can be, in order to be able to bounce back and be healthy afterwards, you need to address this. So this is a time to bring up, yes, you're smoking marijuana. We need to address that now. Yes, what, what you're drinking, you may minimize it and say you're drinking five or six beers, but it's only once a week. That qualifies as episodic binge drinking. And if we identify that as a problem and help them get it at that point, they're going to, be, they're going to take it more seriously. If we sort of say, oh, well, no problem, that wasn't on our checklist, they're not going to change. And it may affect their long-term health. We're concerned short and long-term health. Um, we also look at support and who do they live with and what kind of, um, not only the number of people in their support system or the number of people who come with them, but what's the quality of that support. Um, we do lots of family meetings or meet with lots of families. Sometimes the family members are texting throughout the interview or they are um, dozing off in a stupor. Um, and that may give you some, uh, some little red flags about are they really going to be there for our patient. And um, we need 
quality support. With the donor, it's usually fairly briefly. Um, recipients, sometimes they need long-term pretty intensive support. And we also look at a combination between cognitive dysfunction and support. So if somebody is cognitively impaired, they're going to need more support. They're going to need somebody to come with them to the doctor visits to understand what's going on and to be able to help them. Some of our patients, you know, we have uh, a unique diversity uh, of patients here um, that runs a, a huge range in terms of education, occupation, um, financial stability, and things like that. And our goal is to safely help people get through this process, but we need to identify early what are the issues and what can we do to help people safely get through this. We also need to look at advanced directives, and I think that everybody needs an advanced directive before any surgery because we've got, again, diversity. We have lots of patients who are living with somebody, but they're married to somebody else they haven't seen for a long time, or they have a fiancé of 25 years who's who they want to make medical decisions, but that person has no legal um, authority. The hospital can't even say, yes, they're in the hospital. So advanced directives are really important. Not necessarily all the details about the medical decisions, but just who do you trust to make medical decisions? And putting that in writing and telling the person, you're the one that I trust, I want you to be there, and I want you to make medical decisions for me, if that ever became necessary. These are things that are, are required um, whether the decision to donate is free of inducement, coercion, or un other undue pressure. Certainly, if you know there's a big hunk of money associated with it, yes, that, that is an issue. But sometimes it's much more subtle. And, and I think um, it, it is okay if after the fact the recipient chooses to voluntarily do something, and some of our recipients do send the donor to college or whatever, but if is the decision made on the basis of some kind of expectation, and is that expectation realistic and shared? Um, so if the donor expects something, but that's not what the recipient has in mind, we need to pull that out and be able to talk about that. Um, and the issue of the recipient's health um, I think it's important not that the hospital or any member of the team divulge information about the recipient's health or longevity, but I think the donor should talk to them about, you know, what is the cause of your kidney failure or liver failure? And, you know, what have the doctors told you? So they need to be talking about that and have realistic expectations. We need to be able on our checklist to say, uh, can they cope with major surgery and related stress? Again, these donors often haven't had anything like this and, you know, say, oh, I can cope with anything, but um, sometimes that's hard to really say. We need to be able to identify that these have all been um, addressed. Some other issues have come up where the donor is a young person who is the breadwinner for and has a family with several little children and isn't going to be getting any benefits. Um, we need to make sure that they've thought that through and they know what the risks are or that they would lose their job from being off of work for the time that they need to be off work. I also see people who really have unrealistic expectations about how long they need to be off work. Where, well, I have one week vacation and I could go to Mexico or I could go to donate this kidney. Um, that's, that's probably not realistic going back to work in a short period of time like that. Let's see. Um, these are things that we ask also. What are their hopes about the, the um, outcome of the donation? Um, what's the relationship? How is it going to change the relationship with the, between the donor and the recipient? But it's not always just the relationship between the donor and the recipient. They may have expectations that um, if I donate, somebody else is going to have a better relationship. We had a, a young man who wanted to donate to his fiance's sort of uncle's wife or something like that. 
and you know he wanted to have a better relationship with the fiance not not specifically the recipient who he didn't really know so if there are expectations about changing the relationships with somebody in this whole system it's important to be able to talk about that and see how realistic that is and if you want to get closer to somebody the phones work pretty well but you know and are quicker and easier and cheaper than surgery if that's how you want to have a better relationship um, I I asked them about the story on CNN I don't know if you all heard of it last year but where a man donated a kidney for his wife and then they ended up getting a divorce and he wanted the kidney back did you all hear that one but it makes them think about things they laugh and they oh that's ridiculous but it makes them think about this is a gift that cannot be repaid and returned once it's given um, it belongs to the recipient and if there are any issues up front they need to talk about them before any surgery takes place and we talk about any second thoughts and did they want a medical exclusion and how they'd feel if they were unable to donate how they'd feel if they donated and the recipient had complications or if they donated and the donor had complications and again sometimes there's sort of a denial like oh I'm healthy that's not going to happen to me but they need to I basically I tell them well talk to your doctor about that and hopefully that sort of tees it up for the next discussion with with their doctor um, let's see okay well I wish we had a lot of time to talk about this because ethical issues are really good for opening up for discussion but it's five o'clock and and um, if anybody has questions or thoughts we can certainly throw it open Any questions uh, from the floor, uh, Dr. Danny? I, I yes. Particularly with the paternity, with the paternity issue, because. If I, I now ask you to sign information that if we find out that there's a paternity issue, that you're okay with it, and you don't sign, well, that's a sign to you that maybe there's a problem. So that's one thing that I would probably just probably leave out altogether. Um, the other issue is having donors and recipients talk about medical issues. I think we should maybe ask them to speak about how you feel about donating, what does dad look like, whatever. But a lot of times when non-medical people get together, they make conclusions that are not accurate. Uh, when you have hepatitis C, uh, your guys are going to die, or you got a CDC high risk, you're going to have HIV or something like that. Um, I thought most of it was also very good and it lets us really think about uh, deeply what we say to patients other than see you in the OR and that kind of thing. Dr. Denny, as always, we are on the same page. Even though you're from Ohio State, I'm, I'm from Michigan. Okay, <laughs> we're on the same page. I agree with you, but. This was the first time I was facing the problem of misattributed paternity in our living donor program. And when I went into the literature, there's extensive literature in genetic testing about this. And there they recommend very strongly that both the persons being tested must sign in advance saying that they understand the implications of a misattributed paternity being discovered. And if so, whether they want it divulged, and only if both of them sign, we can divulge it. Obviously, you can't divulge it to one person and not to the other person. And this is going to happen. Uh, it may not happen as frequently as in the genetic arena, but it's going to happen in our transplant population also, especially with in vitro fertilization, surrogate mothers, the ovum donors, sperm donors, and so on. Uh, we are going to see more and more of these problems in the future. Uh, I must say that the new revised guidelines that Linda Munro brought to my attention do not mention anything about misattributed paternity, but this may be something we may have to be proactive about and address up front because we are going to face this problem more and more. Uh, do you have any comments? Well, if I may, on, the, on that same note, I wonder if, if saying paternity is, is necessarily inclusive enough because like you're, just like you're saying with various ad, um, involve, or advances in fertility, not just paternity, but potentially siblings, 
cousins, you know. I mean, yeah. so it, it, it was saying paternity is, is actually limiting in my mind in the sense of, you know, it could be any number of, inter, you know, familial relationships that are not necessarily genetically bound. The answer, my answer to that will be that only when you're dealing with a parent-offspring relationship, HLA testing can tell you that this is not a biological relationship. Siblings can be completely HLA mismatched, one in four chance that they might inherit different HLA antigens from the mother and father. So it is only feasible with the limited testing that we do, HLA testing, to be sure about this in the parent offspring situation. I have a question and a comment. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> on the pain issue and the emotional reaction from the donors, my sense is that uh, the emotional reaction is very unpredictable, no matter how much we screen. Mm -hmm. And it can range from stoic uh, behavior where nothing will face me to post-traumatic stress syndrome and depression uh, and even through that. Uh, so from my perspective, just for the team, treat every uh, living donor with silk gloves and always be exploring what their emotional reaction would be and do not act surprised if they react in any shape or form. Be open-minded about it. If you sense that it's something that is not usual, engage the psychiatry or psychology team, and, and also be supportive because uh, these few folks do not know what to expect, no matter how much we prepare them. Along the same thread, the issue with pain. Uh, pain for them, a 4 over 10, maybe a 1 over 10 for somebody with cancer, and because they just don't know what to expect, and there is an emotional overlay associated with that. So therefore, a standard order of a PCA pump for patient X means nothing for patient Y. Each one of them has their own equation, their own formula, their own needs, and so we have to customize. Once we arrive the original orders, we have to go back and say, how is this pain control for you? What can I do for you? What is it that's bothering you? I'm going to do this for you, and you specify what you're going to do, and then you come back and check on them later to see if 3D worked for them and if it doesn't work for them without really being too overbearing and condescending or anything like that. So please be and educate a lot of the other care providers. I think when we have residents rotating on the service, they may not be as aware of the psychological overlay with these owners. Question uh, to you is, have you ever had to engage the um, ethics committee in any decisions related to living donation, or ha have you managed to control it always within the domain of the transplant team? I have never involved the ethics committee in any of these decision making. Now, uh, that is an issue to be looked at, whether when you have particularly difficult ethics issues, whether we should involve the ethics committee. My personal preference will be to limit it to the transplant team, because I think the ethics committee is more involved and more knowledgeable about end of life decisions than this sort of decisions and so on. Regarding the pain, I'm not going to disagree with the uh, chairman of the Transplant Institute. All that I'm saying is that don't oversell that laparoscopic nephrectomy is a very benign procedure and pain is very minimal and so on. At least address the possibility that the pain may be worse and the post-operative recovery might be more difficult than what most people experience after love. I think this issue should be put there as to whether they it will register in their mind given the fact that many of them are very healthy and never had surgery, as Anne said, it's very difficult to predict, but at least you've gone on record telling them that things may be worse than what they expect. Mm -hmm. I think they expect to secure it as much as they expect the pain that they cared for. In other words, when they say more pain, and it's always going to be more than they thought, I think from their side is that they expect to see if the sense of the team is caring about their concerns, reacting to their needs, and is engaged without any attitudinal prejudices regarding their pain management. And I agree with you, no matter how small the operation is going to be. Because it's not always necessarily what we call objective standard of pain care. Very few of these folks have problems with pain management long term. Mm -hmm. It's very small. Um, and as far as your question about the ethics committee, I've been on the ethics committee for many years, and we haven't had any living donor issues come to the ethics committee. Um, we certain the ethics committee certainly could address issues, but um, usually what comes to the committee is a conflict, and I think as long as it's resolved in the team, that's the best way to do it. 
And in fact, when something comes to the Ethics Committee, the department that brings the issue to the Ethics Committee needs to educate the committee about it. And often the response is, well, what are your protocols? Follow your protocols. We have had uh, transplant-related issues come to the Ethics Committee. The most memorable one I can remember uh, recently was we had an incarcerated felon who needed a heart transplant, um, but nothing in the living donor issue. Another question? And I had one comment. Yes, um, my son is an emergency medicine physician and also chairs the ethics committee for his health system. So he was a very valuable resource to me. I sent my presentation to him, and as expected, he said, Dad, this is a lousy presentation. <laughs> he wanted a thousand revisions. Other point I want to make is that in his new capacity as a CMO, um, Marwan, I understand that one of your major roles is going to be in recruiting and retention of physicians. I hope you'll decide to retain me after this presentation. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Meeting this. Thank you.